Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Manager at the Hendricks Center here at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic on the Table podcast today is gospel differences in the passion narratives. We're going to be taking a look at the different ways that the gospel writers um, portray the events that happened during the Passion Week. And I have two guests joining me today via Zoom. First guest is Dr. Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement and Senior Research Professor of New Testament here at DTS. Welcome back to the show, Daryl. Uh, glad to be with you and glad to be in this chair and not the one you're sitting in. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being one of our expert guests on the show today. And my second guest is Mike Lycona. Mike is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Mikkel. Wonderful to be with you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. So in this uh, podcast, we want to talk about the differences that we see in the gospel narratives in relation to the Passion Week specifically. One of the challenges that sometimes people will throw out when we're trying to share uh, what the Bible says about Jesus with them is that uh, there are supposedly contradictions in the Bible, and specifically in the Gospels. And so just to kind of set the table for our discussion, Daryl, um, let me ask you, what it, what is really actually at stake when we're talking about these differences that we see and understanding them in the Gospels? Well, to the extent that people either uh, accept or reject the credibility of the Gospels obviously impacts the extent to which they will take the presentation of Jesus in the in the Gospels seriously. So, um, so it becomes an important discussion because oftentimes what happens is is in the claim about differences, which often quickly get changed into contradictions, uh, there becomes. Uh, an attempt as a result to kind of distance the reader from accepting the way in which the Gospels are presenting Jesus, and thus um, putting them out of touch with the way, at least, in which the Christian faith has presented uh, Jesus to them. So so there's a, potentially a lot at stake, depending on the level of cynicism that comes uh, with that conversation. Mm-hmm. Now, Mike, you actually wrote a book called Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? And uh, in that book, you talk about an ancient author by the name of Plutarch and how studying his writings actually helped you kind of understand what what we're seeing here with some of the differences um, just on a a high level. Could you give us um, just a summary of why studying Plutarch helped you? Most scholars, New Testament scholars today, regard the Gospels as either uh, ancient biographies or that they share a lot of common with the genre of ancient biography. Well, ancient biography didn't operate by the same literary conventions as modern biographers do. Um, They had um, a, a license to be a little more flexible with how they reported some details. But to what extent and how would that impact a reading of the Gospels if they belong to that genre? So what I wanted to do was, well, study ancient biographies to, to see what kind of uh, level of flexibility they would take in the reporting of details. So I put a list together of all the biographers, biographies that had been written about anyone within 150 years on each side of Jesus, and there are about 90 of them, 90 or somewhere around there, 90 or a few more. And um, Plutarch wrote 48 of those. So he wrote at least half, more than half of all the biographies, extant biographies of that time. Um, Only four written by uh, Jewish historians. You've got three by Philo and one, an autobiography by Josephus. So um, I I read uh, Plutarch's lives. I read, um, notice that nine of them involve figures that knew one another for the most part and participated in the same events. I reread those nine, and then I read them another, a third time, and I made a note of all the differences in them, because I wanted to see how Plutarch would tell the same story on multiple times. Does he copy and paste? What's he do? Mm-hmm. And so we have the same author, in many cases, using the same sources, and in at least seven of those biographies, he's writing simultaneously, writing them simultaneously. So we can see what Plutarch does with the same source material. Um, and what kind of changes he makes. From those changes, we can infer, if there's a lot of them, we can infer various compositional devices. 
And so I figured if we read the differences in the Gospels in view of those sort of compositional devices, would that shed light on the differences? And man, it's like creating a new lens through which to look, and it mm. sheds a whole lot of light on uh, why there are differences in the Gospels. Hmm. Well, we're going to come back to some of those differences uh, specifically, and we'll take a look at some specific cases um, to see what, what kind of light that sheds on these gospel differences. Daryl, actually, you wrote a book as well uh, called Truth in a Culture of Doubt, which answers some of these kinds of uh alleged contradictions. Uh, for example, sometimes people will bring up uh, the length of events. So, for example, Jesus' trial in front of Pilate is really a lot longer in John than in Mark. Um, how would we begin to approach that kind of an objection, Daryl? Well, you have to ask a couple of questions. One, uh, one of the most basic of which is, what is John doing in relationship to the synoptics? And it doesn't take much comparative work between John and the Synoptics to realize that somewhere around 85 to 88 percent of John is not in the Synoptics. So he's already made a decision before we start that I'm going to tell you stuff that is not in the other Gospels, or at least in the tradition streams that fed the other Gospels. One of the debates New Testament scholars have is whether John knew the Gospels, how many of them did he know, uh, or is he working independently of that? What we can be pretty confident of is he's not working independently of the tradition streams about Jesus that were circulating in the major churches of that period. And so um, when you do that work, you realize he's consciously going after telling you stuff that the synoptic gospels, generally speaking, didn't dwell on. So in some cases, he skips stuff that they mention. So there's no detail, for example, of uh, the Last Supper in terms of the meal itself, uh, which, interestingly enough, uh, we know he would have been aware of because the church observed uh, the Lord's table on the basis of the Last Supper, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it, it feeds into to, you know, what each author is attempting to achieve in writing the way that they've written and also how they're interacting with the sources that either they're aware of or they know people that they're writing to are aware of. Mm -hmm. That's one dimension of it. A and so in this particular case, I think what we've got is uh, a situation where John has uh, more awareness of what took place beyond the short meetings that you see in the synoptics with Pilate. Um, the synoptics are almost more concerned with Barabbas and the pressure that Pilate was under to make a decision from the Jewish leadership, although you do see that in John as well, and uh, and pursue uh, some of the interactions that took place in a little more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's something that Daryl says a lot that that has just been ingrained in my my memory, which is the idea that difference doesn't always equal contradiction. And so in this particular case, um, let me ask Mike, is this uh, very different with how we see um, other events treated in classical literature, like I think about life of Alexander the Great, for example, how different is what we're seeing in the Gospels? Well, there's a lot of similarities and there are a lot of differences. Um, the, the, you, you've got the fact that the same kind of differences that we typically find in the ancient literature, the Greco-Roman and even Jewish literature, are the same kind of differences we find uh, commonly throughout the Gospels, the same kind of differences. Um, but what's really striking about the Gospels, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is not necessarily the differences, but the similarities. Hmm. See, when I was doing my work with Plutarch, I was thinking, okay, well, if he's using the same kind of sources, he's got, you know, I found 36 stories, pericope, in, in, in those nine lives that he wrote. Um, that are found in two or more of those lives. And so I figure, well, he's got to be copy and pasting some of this. He never does that. Hmm. He's always paraphrasing. Uh, he'll, he'll expand and give additional thoughts, or he'll subtract for brevity, or he'll change a statement to a question or transfer what one person said to another person and, and things like this, displace an event out of its original context and transplant it in another. He does all these kinds of things. Um, but when you come to the Plutarch and the way he reports the same, you never see the degree of verbal similarity that you find in the Synoptic Gospels, which in many cases is verbatim or nearly so. You don't see that in the other ancient literature. Hmm. Um, 
and and from what we know from the compositional textbooks, etc., it shouldn't be that way that you find in the Gospels. And so, the, I mean, they kind of break the rules by having so many similarities. Hmm. So the question would be why. We can only guess. It could be that they just had such a, a respect for, for the tradition that they stayed as close to it as they did. Hmm. Well, let's take a look at some of these uh, specific ones around the passion uh, of Jesus, especially in terms of the crucifixion. Uh, one of the most uh, well-attested historical facts about Jesus, of course, is his death by crucifixion. And most, uh, virtually all scholars will accept that as historical bedrock. But sometimes in popular conversation, people will say, well, I'm not so sure if we can trust those accounts because, like, how many women were at the foot of the cross, for example? And you have this wonderful appendix at the end of your, your book, Appendix 3, uh, that lays this out. So let's take a look at this. Quickly, we can see in Mark 15, Who's at the foot of the cross? We have uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and a lady named Salome. Then in Matthew 27, it's Mary Magdalene, Mary the, the mother of James and Joseph, and then the mother of the sons of Zebedee. In Luke, there's women but no names. In John 19, it's Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister, Mary Magdalene again, and Mary the wife of Clopas. There are a lot of Marys back in the first century. Um, <laughs> how do we make sense of all of these these names? Um, what's going on here? Well, it, it's hard hard to tell exactly. Um, you do have four Marys that are in that uh, in those uh, narratives uh, to combined. Four Marys and a few others, um, like you mentioned, the, the wife of Clopas. Uh, that's one of the Marys. You've got uh, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You've got Salome, as you mentioned, um, Joanna. So you, the, as Tao Ilan and uh, Richard Baucom have shown, Mary was a very common name in Judea at that point. In fact, um, I think it's one out of every five women, something like that, one out of every four or five women in that time, Jewish women, were named Mary. Hmm. So it, it shouldn't, um, and Salome, was a very, very popular name. It's like, I don't know, 30% of all women there were named either Salome or Mary. Hmm. So we're going to expect to find these names okay. in the New Testament. We're going to expect to find several uh, of them. So it shouldn't uh, surprise us when there's four Marys there. But to, to compare them between the different accounts, is it's difficult because, you know, they're not, I don't think that they're trying to mention all of the people there. They could be they're mentioning the ones from whom they got the the testimony. Maybe the, he's they're naming the eyewitnesses, or maybe the the witnesses from that tradition. It's just really difficult to to tell. But I don't think that any of them are trying to be exhaustive in who they're reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all you know, I I stole something from Mike that if I may apply here, and mm. it's what's called guy and gal telling, <laughs> and. Um, uh, and the way I explain it in, in my marriage is if I ask my wife if I have to be at dinner, she'll start with my day at six o'clock in the morning, walk through my day and then explain the rationale for why my presence is or is not required. Mm -hmm. If she asks me, if she has to be at dinner, she's going to get a one word answer. Yes or no. OK. And it's just the way we're built. Um, we're, we're built to tell what we see differently. Some people are built to tell the details. Other people are built um, to say it as briefly and concisely as possible. That's a factor in one sense you can't test entirely. I mean, you can look at what someone presents and maybe figure out that's what it is, but you don't know that just from the way they interact. And there, I expand the joke by talking about Hall Harris and his wife, because uh, Ursula, of course, was German. You asked her, you would get a ya or a nine answer from her. But if you asked Hall, I called him Dr. Google, he would start with the history of hospitality in the Greco-Roman world and then work his way to the answer of the question. <laughs> so you just get people who, are, who, who process stuff differently, see things differently, are attracted to certain details and not attracted to certain details. And it's very, very difficult for us, 2,000 years away from those writers and not having known them personally, you know, what that is. The best that we can do is deal with the remnants of what they give us. So that's one factor that's just hard to trace, but it is a reality of the way people process information. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other is the concerns that they have to whoever it is they're writing that drives what they're writing as well, which also produces another factor. 
So there's just a lot that goes into, you know, they aren't trying to give a stenographer's account of everything that you might want to know about the event. Mm -hmm. They're doing something else. And we have to respect the fact that they've approached the question in this somewhat detached way for the kinds of questions we want to ask from the, what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all historical reporting is is by definition selective, right? You can't write every single detail down, and then that's not their their point either. Um, something that happened on the cross is sometimes brought up um, in terms of how Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels. And Daryl, you wrote about this in Truth and a Culture of Doubt. Um, and this reminds me of sometimes if you go to an art gallery and you take a look at these uh, classic paintings of the crucifixion, in some paintings of the crucifixion, Jesus just looks really haggard and tortured, and he, he looks like he's crying out in despair. And you see that kind of portrait in Mark 15. He's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people like to, to pit that against the other depiction where sometimes you see Jesus on the cross in a very commanding kind of pose, like he's in full control of what's going on. And you get that uh, that feel in Luke uh, 23, for example, where he says, um, into, into your hands do I commit my spirit. As people try to pit that against each other sometime, how do we understand those two portrayals, Daryl, of Jesus on the cross? Well, the interesting thing is to take those two accounts and, and look at them in a synopsis and to look at what point in the crucifixion sequence, which we know lasted for hours, um, are we at any given point, depending on which version we're in. And what you find out very quickly is that Mark's, uh, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me remark, is very much on the earlier end of the time of the crucifixion. And then Mark actually has a remark in which he says, um, and a second time, Jesus cried out. Mm -hmm. And that's all he says. Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't tell us what he said. He just said he cried out a second time. Mm. But when you look at it in the synopsis, the very slot where Mark has Jesus crying out a second time is exactly where Luke has his remark, into your hands I commend my spirit, which, of course, is coming right before the end of the sequence as he's dying. And he's really giving himself over to the Father for the vindication that that resurrection is going to represent. He's represented himself as saying to the leadership, you're going to put me to death, but God's going to vindicate me. And you're going to see that vindication. Mm -hmm. And so that last remark is that movement into that vindication space because he's going to die. And if he's going to come back to life, God's going to have to raise him from the dead. And so you get this shift in which the first saying from Mark is dealing with the sin question, if I can say it that way. And the second remark from Luke, that's a little more confident, is really a, the language of trust coming out of a psalm in which the psalmist is trusting God for his care. Um, and, uh, you know, it's entirely, I think it's entirely plausible that in the midst of this long sequence of crucifixion, you move from this despair about what Jesus is facing, which was already signaled in Gethsemane with his prayer, mm -hmm. you know, all the way over to, all right, this is it. So, uh, you know, I'm handing the baton off to you. You're going to you're gonna either vindicate me or not here, and I'm trusting you to do what the plan says. So that's, that's how I would put it together. I, I'm interested to see what Mike thinks, but that's how I would put it together. Hmm. Yeah, Mike, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, John is going to look at things, uh, quote him a little different. So, um, now, I have to go back and look at Matthew and Mark, but it seemed to me that when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a, a penultima statement of, of, of Jesus on the cross uh, right before he did the loud cry and died. But maybe Daryl's right here, um, but um, I, I seem to remember it a little bit differently. John, when you come to John, instead of saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, I'm thirsty. That's the penultimate statement. And then, but the very last statement is, it is finished. So instead of saying, into, Father, into your hands, I entrust my spirit, he says, it is finished. Now, it, it means pretty much the same thing, uh, um, you could say, but it would show the extent to perhaps to which one of them, probably John, is paraphrasing. Um, and Johannine specialists, uh, all seem to agree that that John is um, he's reporting different 
uh, tradition in terms of the stories, but he's also doing some things with Jesus's words. So, for example, no one really questions the orthodoxy or conservatism of F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on the Gospel of John and in introductory information uh, uh, material, says that what uh, John does with the Jesus tradition is it's a translation of the freest kind, it's an expanded paraphrase, and a transposition into another key. Hmm. Um, you've got uh, Paul Anderson, a, a Johannine specialist, saying he calls John a theological paraphrase. So, um, I, you know, John here, I think he's taking some of Jesus's words, and the reason we do find some some of the things, like the crucifixion scene, a little bit different. So, um, you were talking about portraits. You know, Jesus is kind of in agony. Why have you forsaken me there at the end? Um, but in John, he's just kind of calm up on the cross. Even in the uh, in Gethsemane, you know, you've got Jesus real he's sweating it father if it's your will let this cup pass for me but that's not so in in john's gospel he's he's pretty uh pretty passive in the garden um so it's it's almost like john airbrushes some of this stuff out jesus is worried not completely from john at the end in the passion narrative but most of it he just airbrushes it out and he gives us a little different view of jesus there uh, perhaps to emphasize his deity. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think it's interesting to see, and and Mike's right to bring in John alongside of this because your original question was, um, you know, what are we getting from Mark? Are we getting Psalm twenty-two verses one, verse one, versus what we get in Luke from Psalm thirty-one, verse what five or six? And and the and so that's one dimension is what's happening within the synoptics, but you put John next to it. And John is doing something different. I like to tell people when they think about this, and they think about paraphrasing and that kind of thing, and that can make them sometimes nervous, is to say, what John is oftentimes doing is making explicit things that were implicit in what Jesus was saying as we get them in the synoptics. Hmm. Okay? So it's there. It's just that he's bringing it to attention, and he's bringing it to attention because he started the story in a different place. Mm -hmm. I like to say that John tells the story of Jesus from heaven down. The synoptics tell the story of Jesus from earth up. Yeah. And the point that I'm making is in the synoptics, you watch it dawn on people who Jesus is. Okay. And they grow in their understanding of him. And, and the writers almost present Jesus in such a way that you can watch that process happen. Okay. But John, from the very first verse, tells you exactly what he's doing. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is CNN. You know, right from the very first verse, you know where he's coming from in terms of his presentation of Jesus. He's the only one that has this extensive prologue that goes before even Jesus was born, that talks about his preexistence explicitly, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That's not something someone historically experienced, if I can say it that way. That is a theological um, deduction based upon the confession that Jesus is divine. And so those are the kinds of moves that John is making uh, that help to fill out his portrait and, and that allow him, give him the, the room um, to, to, you know, to present this, if I can say, more explicit presentation of Jesus you know, in light of, and now I'm going to appeal to Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, mm. you know, in terms of, uh, of what the um, early church has come to see about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, we can see that uh, difference isn't necessarily mean contradiction, and we can take a look at these things uh, alongside each other and uh, kind of put some of the details together. I think your, your remark about Mark 15, 37 and the second cry makes a lot of sense as well. But you guys have both debated Bart Ehrman in one way or another, uh, live or via um, podcast, and one of the things he likes to say often is that you can harmonize these things if you want, but you have to recognize that you're now making a different gospel. How do we respond to people who say it's just not right to harmonize these things because you're, you're doing violence to the text by making your own story? Uh, Mike, how would you respond to that? 
Well, I'd, I'd have to agree with Bart there uh, to an extent. I do think that there are times when you can and perhaps should harmonize the account. But once you, you, you begin to see what these ancient authors were doing with the compositional devices that we can infer through Plutarch and other ancient authors to see the kind of paraphrasing and other techniques that are actually prescribed for historians to use, uh, prescribed by the compositional textbooks that we find in Theon, Athonius, and, and Quintilian and others, then I, I think that that should be our default position by understanding why there are differences in the Gospels and to try to harmonize the differences in many occasions, not all, but in many occasions, would be to go down the wrong road and we'll end up with a, a, a wrong answer. So um, I, I would agree with Bart to an extent that you shouldn't try to harmonize everything and it can go too far. I, I think today there are three basic kinds of approaches that that conservatives, the pious, take toward the uh, differences. You've got the ostrich who sticks his head down into the sand mm. and says, oh, I know they're there, but I, I just can't deal with them. They trouble me too much. Don't talk about them. <laughs> and, and then you've got the peacemaker. Um, can't we all just get along? You know, we can just harmonize these accounts and all of the details are correct. We can create a, a, a harmony that that includes all the details. And then there's the cruel interrogator that does violence to the text and subjects them to hermeneutical waterboarding mm -hmm. until they tell him what he wants to hear. And that's what I uh, would, I think all three of those have problems. So I, I think it's best to, to try to, to look at these through the lens of how these ancients would write. Um, and that's going to give us a clearer view of what the evangelists were intending to, to communicate to their readers. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. There's there's one qualification I think I would put on it, and that is that what at least the attempt to harmonizing does and what the recognition that ultimately there's one author, which of course is what Christians believe behind this does, is it says there's ultimately some kind of a unity that's going on here, whether it's a unity that that stays focused on i'm coming at this from a different angle so i'm telling you something different all the way over to a way in which there are there are ways to think about this going together and what the harmonizing can do as long as it's not too outlandish is it can show that the declaration that this is definitely a contradiction and that there's something very definitely wrong here is not an automatic or a default place to land with some of these um, details and discussions that we get into. And in the midst of doing that, there may be places where you go, I'm not sure this is the solution. I'm not sure this is the answer. But it is one way to think about the fact, and this is often the case with any event in any scenario, is you get two people talking about the same event who haven't colluded with one another about what they're going to say. They're going to bring up different details, different differences, and they're going to put the package together very, very differently. If you talk to my wife and me about our courtship, you're going to get two very related but very distinct stories about how that worked and what was the big moment and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, as we uh, come to the end of our time together here, let's think about how your uh, pastor who's listening to this or your Christian who wants to engage in spiritual conversations during Easter time, especially to talk about the, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, um, how they might approach uh, conversations where these kinds of detailed things come up um, and they feel like these are just blocks getting in their way of um, them trying to share the gospel and they're kind of uh, not sure how to even begin understanding or responding to these things. Um, Mike, how would you counsel somebody who um, wants to share the gospel but is is afraid of these kinds of uh, um, issues that come up? How can they prepare themselves? Well, I, I, that's an easy one for me. Um, I, I would just say, don't get caught in weeds. Don't crawl around in the weeds of these gospel differences. I mean, I think it's fascinating. I, I've studied them for over eight years, and I find it a fascinating thing. But um, if, if I were a person and um, you, you're just not interested in getting familiar with this, the, the most important point that you can make is that if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. It's game, set, match. Hmm. And um, if Jesus rose from the dead, he did so at least two decades before the first gospel was written. And so Christianity would have been true during all that time. So any problems in the Gospels wouldn't negate the truth of Christianity if Jesus rose from the dead. And I think we got sufficient historical evidence to show, uh, at least from a historian's viewpoint, that Jesus 
probably, and that's all we can say as a historian, Jesus probably rose from the dead. And if he did, Christianity's true, game, set, match. Hmm. Yeah, and the other half of it with Jesus' ministry, I like to say, if a student spends three and a half years with me, in, well, you know, while they're in seminary, you know, I'm assuming a THM here. Uh, but anyway, if they spend three and a half years with me, four years with me, and they listen to me on a regular basis, they're going to know what my emphases are. You know, uh, if you talk to different students, they might have different details that they tell about me, but they're going to know what I taught and what I thought in, in core areas. And so if, if the apostles hung out with Jesus for three and a half years, they're going to sort out whether Jesus presented himself as the Messiah and the answer to God and the promise of God and all that. They're going to they're going to probably get that right. Um, and and so and that's what we see in the core of the tradition is this consistent voice about who Jesus is that sets up why the resurrection happened and what's going on with that. So I'm saying that between what Mike is saying, and what I'm saying, you kind of get a package deal. Mm -hmm. You get a twofer, okay, in the Gospels. And in the midst of that, um, you get something that to reflect on. They probably got those themes right. And if those themes are right, then your conversation about Christianity can take place. And that's really the point. Um, sometimes I tell people we get lost in people's what I call inerrancy lists. Hmm. Okay. You know, so they bring up this question, you answer that one, they go, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And they stay there and you never get to Jesus. Okay. I prefer to flip that. Okay. Hmm. Not that the details aren't important. They are, but to simply say, let's not lose sight in getting down in the weeds about, you know, what the real picture is and what the real issue is that we need to be dealing with. And that real issue is who is Jesus and, and what was he about? And I think the Gospels are very clear in their similarities in their presentation to, to make crystal clear what that issue is. He's in the middle of what God is doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, just to bring our discussion uh, together and, and to a close, I like what Mike said as well. Um, we have to remember that history um, can only yield so high of statistics but our conviction as believers in the resurrection of Jesus goes beyond statistics. We're not just uh, uh, stuck with as high as history can give us. Maybe as historians we are, but there's, there's a lot more um, that makes me confident in Jesus' resurrection. And I would commend to our listeners two things. One, um, the book, uh, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus that Mike Lycona wrote with Gary Habermas, which was one of the first books that I read on the resurrection, got me really interested in historical Jesus studies through uh, this by way of the resurrection. Um, that will really help you um, in, in thinking through how to use this information in conversation, talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And then finally, we also have a, a podcast episode that we did with Gary Habermas on the resurrection of Jesus um, called uh, Truth and the Vindication of Jesus and His Resurrection. So please check that out. Daryl, thanks so much for being with us today on the show. My pleasure. Mike, thank you again for being with us. My pleasure, Mikhail. And we thank you so much for joining us on The Table today. Please do subscribe to The Table podcast on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening or watching this. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, and I hope that you'll join us again next time here on The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well. Thank you.